Hey guys, I'm super excited that the day has finally come for me to launch my in-depth analysis of my best of five finals match against Ian Weinstein at the recent Scrabble Players Championships held in South Bend, Indiana. Now, many of you probably already know the result of this match, and some of you have already probably watched the live broadcast. Now, if you have, then you know it was an extremely exciting back and forth match, and there was not a boring game in this series. If there, in fact, was not a boring turn in this series. So what that means is we are hopefully going to have five very not boring videos this week as I go over these games in great detail. Now, as I've mentioned before, I'm going to be doing five videos this week on the five games. Today on Monday will be game one, tomorrow game two, Wednesday game three, Thursday game four, and finally Friday the decisive game five. So let's go ahead and jump right in. I was first this game. This is actually important, guys. I had the better record during the main event, and that meant I got to go first in odd-numbered games, which was a slight advantage because assuming we went to a game five, which as it turns out we did, I got to go first in three out of the five games. Now, it's not a huge advantage to go first in Scrabble, but it's definitely a noticeable advantage because on average you get half a turn more than your opponent, so this very well may have been a factor, just something to keep in mind. But in any case, I was first, opening rack E-E-I-K-L-N-O. Close to some bingos like nose-like or oven-like, but I need a floater, which I don't have. I ended up playing coin for 28 points. This looks like a pretty solid play. I could play shorter with something like oak for 14, but that's a little bit too big a sacrifice. E-I-L-N is a good leave. It's not a good enough leave to justify giving up 14 points for coin when E-L is also a fine leave in its own right. So it looks like a good start for me. However, it was an even better start for Ian as I happened to give him the exact tile he needed. He was waiting eagerly for an N for Havering. He got one, and he immediately slapped this down for 69 points. A great start to the finals for Ian. He takes a 69-28 to 28 lead. However, I drew very well after my opening play. I have a lot of bingos here, but I quickly found my best one, the only available double-double of Matalote through the E in Havering. Really, the only decision was which of the T's to make the blank. And it's not a decision that's likely at all to matter in the game, so it's not one that's worth spending more than a couple seconds on. I decided to make the second tee the blank just because I figured Ian was slightly more likely to play there on his next turn and would thus score one fewer point. But again, not really a big deal one way or another. Ian drew a bit of a clunky rack after his bingo. He has five vowels. He has a couple of options here. He ended up playing Wade for 32 points, which I'm pretty sure I agree with. It does keep AEO, which is a little bit too vowel heavy as a leave. That being said, there are a lot more consonants than vowels still unseen in the bag. There are 45 consonants and 28 vowels, so that helps him a little bit. And his other options are just not great. Probably his next best play would be way for 25 under the H-A in Havering. This is fine. It's nice to keep the D to offset the three vowels in Ion's rack, but Wade does score seven more points, so it looks like a reasonable choice to me. Now, Ion does put the W between two triple word scores, but it's not all that scary because the W is already on the double letter score, so it's going to be very hard for me to score big through that W unless I happen to have a bingo, which is pretty unlikely since a W is not a good bingo tile. So it's a tough decision, but I probably would have gone with the same play that Ian did. Now, I had a W myself, so I really don't have anything to do through that W in Wade. I could consider Abwat through the A, which I did look at for a little bit, but it didn't feel like a great play because this A that I'm opening is a little bit scary in the top left. If Ian has the Z, for instance, he could play ZA in the corner for nearly 70 points. He could play something like Gauze vertically through the A for 70 points. It's pretty scary. And I decided that that A was actually more dangerous than the W in the triple-triple line just because the A is so much easier to play through. So I didn't really like that. Instead, I played WAB for 33 under the HA and Havering, scoring well, keeping ESTT. Yeah, I'd rather not keep two Ts, but they don't go too badly together, and with a good draw, I should be able to bingo on my next turn. Ian had a slightly Val-heavy rack once again. He needs an L for Aerolite. Note that Etairio, E-T-A-E-R-I-O, is a Collins-only bingo, not valid in this lexicon, so that is not an option for Ian. He plays Waiter here for 27 points, blowing up his rack. I think this is fine. He could consider playing Shorter with something like O-E for 13 under the W and A in WAB, or maybe even Arrow for 21 down the C column paralleling Wade. But neither of these leaves are all that strong, and with still four S's in a blank unseen to Ian, he really wants the turnover here. This is extra points. I think this is a fine choice. And I still have a little bit of a lead, but it's dwindling. I'm only up 19, 147 to 128. 
And an awkward draw for me after WAP, I pull the F and the V out of the bag. Interesting decision here on this turn, though. I have three viable options. I have Oft for 26 next to the D, E, and Wade. Toft in the same spot, which scores four more, but does get rid of the T, which plays very nicely with the E and the S on my rack. Or I could play Votes and Model Oats, scoring a bit more, getting 34 points, and playing some defense in the bottom left quadrant of the board, but of course getting rid of my valuable S. I discarded this option pretty quickly since the S just seemed too valuable to justify playing off for just four or eight more points. As for Oft versus Toft, it was close. I eventually decided on Oft just because the T, like I said before, is so good with the E and the S. And especially with the V on my rack, I wanted to minimize the number of tiles I played just because each tile I played increased the chances of me getting another clunky consonant like an F or a G that doesn't go well at all with the V. So when I had the V on my rack, I figured let's at least keep as many other good tiles as I can to ensure I'll at least have a balanced rack and hopefully even a bingo on my next turn. So it's a tough call. The engine does slightly gravitate towards Toft, but I'm okay with my decision here to sacrifice the four points and play Oft. Ian had this rack over here, and he had a pretty interesting decision. His two standout options both score 27 points. He can play either Oi, making how and a buy on the nine row, getting the Y on a double letter score, or he can play Iyer down the F column, hooking several plays and also getting 27 points, keeping C-L-O-U. These leaves are both mediocre at best. C-L-O-U is balanced. It has two consonants and two vowels, but it doesn't really have any good bingo tiles or good vowels. The O and the U are the two worst vowels in Scrabble. Oi, on the other hand, does keep two E's, and the E's are the best vowels in Scrabble, but three vowels and two consonants is a little bit vowel-heavy, and the two E's and the U don't go together well either. I eventually settled on Oi, which is a little bit more defensive because it blocks the W on the left. The two E's are useful to keep. There are now five E's left in the game, in addition to the ones Ian has, so if he does get rid of both of them, he does run a risk of not getting an E for several more turns, which would not be great. That being said, Iyer does turn over another tile for the S's as well as the blank, and just keep a more balanced sleeve. I actually think I would have played Iyer if I were Ian in this position, but it's really close. The commentators seem to prefer Oi, and that's what Ian ultimately went with. I think it's a perfectly fine play as well. Just one of those turns in Scrabble where you could really go either way. They sim neck and neck on the engine, and depending on which top player you ask, you might get a different answer. But there isn't really a right or wrong. Both of these plays are totally reasonable. In any case, I had this rack here. I needed an R for severity, which I did not get. A couple choices here. I ended up playing Ivy for 25 down the B column, which looks like the best play by a good margin. It scores well, gets rid of my clunky V and Y, and keeps EEST. I'd rather just keep one of the two E's, but EEST is still a pretty good leave. I briefly considered Evites for 36 on the second row. It scores well, but just seems to blow up my rack a little bit too much and doesn't quite score enough to justify that. Another option is Skeevy for 32, but similarly, it gets rid of my S for only 7 points, and with EEST being such a good bingo leave and multiple S hooks available on this board, such as with coins and model oats, it seemed worth the sacrifice to play Ivy. Ian did not draw well after Oi. He pulled another U out of the bag, and he's got two U's and two E's now. And he makes a really interesting play. He plays Uncle for 17 points next to the T and E in Model O. He saw Kule through the O in coin, but wasn't positive it was a word. If he were positive, he probably would have played it. As it turns out, Uncle is a really interesting idea. It's extremely risky because Ian doesn't have an S, and there are still four S's unseen. However, the upside is twofold. Number one, Ian is down. He is still trailing by 43 points, so he's not in a good position, and it makes sense to take some chances here. With four S's unseen, there's a pretty decent chance Ian pulls one after drawing five tiles from the bag, and if I don't have an S, then he may very well get to use that spot on his next turn. And number two is that if I don't have an S, or for that matter, if I do have an S, but I'm not really dying to use it if I don't have to, I might get scared that Ian has an S after Uncle, even though he actually doesn't. I'm not going to know that, and it might induce me to sacrifice more points than I really should to block. So it's a really interesting idea. Probably I would have gone with kool here, but I think Uncle does have a lot of merit. Let's see how it worked out. I did, of course, have an S. I had one on my last turn, but I don't have any playable bingos here. I certainly thought that there was a good chance that Ian had an S after Uncle, 
because there are still three S's unseen to me at this point, despite having one on my rack. So having a lead, I decided to play it safe and block the hook myself by using it playing Stodge for 36. I think this is the right call here. I could play OG for 22, which keeps the super strong EST leave, and it does take out the S hook on Uncle, but it gives back a lot of counterplay under the E and D and OG on the 15 row, so I wasn't too keen on doing that. I also figured with three more S's unseen, I wasn't too upset about parting with mine since I figured there was a decent chance I would get another one in the immediate or not too distant future. Ian drew another U after Uncle, which doesn't look great at first, however he has several bingos here. He sees all of them, he has the very stylish Eurepus, which plays for 74 on the 2 row or on the J column, however Ian does neither of these, instead going with Pearly U's, another very stylish play through the L and Uncles for 72 points. This makes sense to me. I definitely wouldn't do Eurepus here for 74. It's only two more points and it blows the board wide open, putting a tile in the middle of the triple-triple line. It's close between Eurepus over here and Perlues as Ian played. I think this decision makes a lot of sense though. Take out some space on the left-hand side of the board. Don't give back too much, especially since he now takes the lead for the first time in a while. So my turn here, down 10 points after Ian's bingo. I noticed that I was very close to Compiler through the I in Havering, but unfortunately it makes one invalid two-letter word L-E on the 8-row, so this is not an option for me. However, I have several good choices through the P that I am just opened. I can play Copper, Mopper, or Compel all for 45 points. I quickly discarded Mopper, because while CL is not a bad leave, I didn't really like the C on this board, because seven-letter words that have a C in them typically have the C early in the word, and with no two other words with a C, there wasn't really anywhere on this board that stood out as a good place to play a seven letter word starting with C. So I decided an M or a P would be better. I didn't have a very strong preference between keeping an M with copper or a P with compel, but I did prefer the R to the L. And since compel kept the R, whereas copper kept the L, I decided to go with compel since PR felt like the best of the possible two tile leaves I could keep with a 45 point play in this spot. The commentators and computers agreed with this choice. Ian had a clunky draw after his bingo, but my last play gave him a massive spot for foe for 55, which he found and played very quickly. There's not much to think about here. This is Ian's best play by a big margin, and he takes a 20-point lead. It was a pretty clunky draw for me. This looks like a rack that might make some longer words or bingos, but unfortunately there aren't any, and I really don't have a lot of good options. My highest scoring option is Pying for 21 points down the I column. This keeps LOR, which is not a great leave, but it's certainly not the worst. I could play Lip in the same spot, which keeps a slightly more bingo prone leave in INOR, but it scores 5 fewer points and also gives me one less shot at getting some of the very valuable stuff still in the bag. We have a blank, two S's, as well as a Z, which could be very useful for scoring still unseen. Another option that's much more aggressive is Orpin for 19 points above the S in Pearly U's. This is what I considered along with the other two plays, but it felt a little bit too reckless. I am down, but it's going to be a tie game after my next play, so I'll be down to tempo, not in a great spot, but certainly not in a terrible spot. And Orpin takes an E for Orpine in addition to an S for Orpins, so I just worried with three E's and two S's still unseen, as well as the Q for QI, this just gives back way too much immediate counterplay to Ion. And if I were down a lot more than I was in this position, I'd probably feel the need to take this risk, but I didn't feel my position was that bad after playing down the I column. So I elected to go with Pying for 21 points. Interestingly, the computer seems to prefer Orpin, but I think most human experts here would agree that Pying is sensible at this score, but very interesting turn nonetheless. Ion had this rack, Nothing great, nothing horrible. He finds a really nice play, though, of Kit Bag for 26 points from the KI. This is a nice play, but he has several other options he could consider as well. One of which is Pig Boat for 24, but this seems a little bit too reckless. Putting a T in the middle of a triple-triple line with blank S, S, Z, and several other good vowels and bingo tiles is just asking for trouble. So I definitely would not do this myself, and Ian certainly agreed. The more defensive option, which he also considered, is Bod for 24 points, keeping the fairly clunky G, 
but not exposing a bunch of floaters for bingos that Kitbag does. He ultimately decided here that while he is going to be taking a small lead, he's really not in that great a position because he's going to be up 25 points, but he doesn't have a particularly good rack. And with so much firepower still unseen, he figured that if I picked up a decent rack after pieing, I was probably the favorite to win this game, which is why he felt that playing defensive with Bod probably didn't make that much sense and keeping it open in the long run might actually benefit him even though he has the lead immediately. So definitely counterintuitive, but I think this decision makes a lot of sense. This is exactly what I would have gone for in this position as well. So very tough turn for me now. I am down at 25 points. And the good news is I have bingos, but the bad news is neither of them are particularly exciting to play and for very different reasons. One option is Oleander for 61. Another option is Goldener for 63. Both of these are fairly low scoring as far as bingos go. And like I said before, they both have drawbacks. Goldener is the higher scoring of the two, getting 63 points as opposed to Oleander's 61 but it gives back a huge hotspot on the A throw to Ion. Namely, it puts an E directly between a double letter score and a triple word score. This is especially dangerous with a J and a Z still unseen. Words like Jedi or Zest would score 60 to 70 points for Ion, possibly even more than my bingo scored. So this is something to be very afraid of. Oleander doesn't quite give back as dangerous a hotspot because the R is now on the double letter score. So Ion could have something like Raja or Ritz, but that's going to score now in the 30s or 40s as opposed to the 60s or 70s, because Ion would now only get three instead of six times the value for his high point tile since it wouldn't be able to occupy the double letter score. So that makes Oleander a little bit safer in that regard. The drawback to Oleander, in addition to scoring two fewer points than Goldener, is that it leaves the kit bags hook open for Ion, and with two S's as well as a blank still unseen, there's a pretty decent chance that Ion drew an S if he didn't already have one with kit bag and may be preparing to crush me with a high scoring play or even a bingo over there. So Oleander, definitely better for scoring play defense, Goldener, definitely better for bingo defense. And I was fully aware of this during the game, it was a tough decision. I spent a while on it. I eventually went with Oleander, mostly because of the way the pool looked. Yes, there are a lot of great bingo tiles. S, S, blank, and E, several R's, several N's, T, but there's also J, Q, Z. And I figured if I drew any of those three tiles, he's going to have a hard time bingoing on his next turn. And having just played four tiles, there's a pretty good chance he pulled at least one of those. So I figured the odds of Ion having one of those tiles and smashing me with a 60 plus point play after Goldener were higher than the odds of Ion bingoing after Oleander. The consensus among top players was that Oleander was the better play and that I made the correct call here. Let's see if I got punished. Ion did indeed have the J and he would have smashed me with Jedi for 60 as I predicted if I had played Goldener. However, he also smashed me here, this time with Joel's for 56 points through the L. At least here I did force Ion to blow up his rack a little bit more, getting rid of his E and his S to score that many points. Ion could consider sacrificing a lot to play something like Jot for 30, but that's a 26 point sacrifice, and as good as the E and the S are, Ion is down a lot of points here. Those 56 points are really useful, and I think this play is more or less forced. So with this move, Ion takes a 20 point lead, 381 to 361, and I drew poorly after my bingo, facing a rack of A-H-N-N-Q-R-S. And right here, guys, is where things get absolutely bonkers, so do not go anywhere. I thought during the game that this position was completely trivial, and within a matter of a couple of seconds, slapped down a Chi in the top left corner for 33 points. Now, this seemed like it had to be correct, because it gets rid of my Q, if I don't get rid of my Q now, I figure, depending on what I draw, I might have a very difficult time unloading it in the endgame and maybe even get stuck with it, which would result in an instant loss. I also score 33 points, which is a lot. I retake the lead by 13 points. I keep my only vowel, namely the A, on my rack, which could be super valuable to make sure I don't run out of vowels in the endgame. And also, I leave one tile in the bag. You'll notice that there are two in the bag now, so by playing just a single tile, I leave one in the bag for Ion to deal with. 
This is a good thing because with one tile in the bag, Ian is going to have a lot of uncertainty on this end. He will not know what the one tile in the bag is, and that may make the position a lot more complicated for him and or induce him to make a play that he wouldn't necessarily make if the bag was empty. If I play more than one tile here, I'll empty the bag, and as a result, Ian will have full information of what I have on my rack, and that allows him to plan and play precisely, which is a significant advantage. So with all that in mind, I immediately played Chi for 33 points. Now, as crazy as this sounds, against perfect play from Ian, Chi is not best. The best play here, which I only deduced thanks to Cesar del Solar and the Woogles team's Macondo engine, is not to play Chi. The best play is to keep the Q and play Honin in the top right corner, also scoring 33 points, but keeping the leave of QRS, which seems far worse. So what is going on here? Why is this better? I'm going to go into a lot of detail, maybe too much detail in just a minute, but the two key points that are going to be the themes throughout this analysis are Number one, I am going to need the blank to win this game because I'll need it to help unload all of my clunky constants and I need Ion not to have it because especially if he has the 10 point Z, that's going to give him way too much flexibility and scoring potential in the end game and it's not too hard to see he's going to win easily. So that's point number one. Point number two is that with Honin, yes, I do keep the Q, but I still have Chi in the top left corner for 33 and it's extremely annoying for Ian to block. He'd have to play a single tile up there for just six points, more or less wasting a turn to block it. And if I do pull the blank, I'll be able to play Cheese or possibly Souk somewhere else for a lot of points. So those are the two things to keep in mind. Now let's get into the details of the math. The math is far simpler after Chi, so let's start with that case. One thing to keep in mind before we jump into the math is that it feels safe to assume Ion has more or less a random rack. It's very difficult to draw any inferences as to what Ion kept with his play of Joel's because Joel's scores so many points. Being that it's worth 56 points, I could easily see Ion playing it with a wide range of leaves. He very well could have had the blank, he very well could not have. He very well could have had the Z, he very well could not have. It's very difficult to say, so I think it makes the most sense here to assume Ion has a perfectly random rack. And what that means, is I am equally likely to draw any of the nine remaining tiles unseen to me. So that means after Chi, I'm playing one tile, so I'm drawing one tile. With nine unseen to me, that means I am one in nine, or 11.1% to draw the blank. So that means I'm at most 11.1% to win the game, because we already said that if I don't draw the blank, I'm losing. Now, it does turn out that when I draw the blank, I will always be winning. And I won't go through the detail in all of the possible scenarios, but basically, if I draw the blank, the problem for Ian is that while he can probably score a lot with the Z on his first turn, he's not going to be keeping flexible tiles and he's not going to be able to go out. Some options for him might include Ritz on the 8 row from the R and Oleander, Ritz on the 14 row, very nicely making Erd, Sig, and TE, or Ads on the 14 row, making Sag and DE. However, assuming I draw the blank, then I know Ian is going to have all of the non-blank remaining unseen tiles after any of these plays, and without going through all the details in the endgame, I'll leave you guys to show that after any of those plays by Ian, I'm going to be able to win. Since Ian won't be able to play out on his subsequent turn and holding SH blank, I'll have plenty of firepower to outrun him. Ian could of course make a play that's not one of those, but they're going to score even less, and again, it's not that hard to see with a little analysis that all of those plays are also going to fall well short for Ian. So, it's safe to conclude that QI wins if and only if I draw the blank. So it wins with probability, once again, 1 in 9 or 11.1%. Now let's move on to the far more complex and counterintuitive play of Honin, which as I said before, does win more often than Chi against optimal play from Ion. The key difference here guys is that yes, I do keep the annoying Q, but now I get two chances to draw the blank, not just one. Again, after Chi, I only played one tile, which means I only got to draw one tile out of the two in the bag. After Honin, 
I deplete more than two tiles, so that means I get to draw both of the tiles from the bag, significantly increasing my chances of drawing the blank. So does that mean that Honen is twice as likely to win as Chi, since I get two shots at the blank? No, because I also have a much more inflexible rack after Honen, namely still having to deal with that annoying Q. So I am not necessarily going to just win after Honen only because I draw the blank. Depending on what my other tile is, in addition to the blank, I may or may not be winning. And I'm going to just list in the table here, again, I would never, ever have figured this out on my own. Some of these endgames are absolutely sick. I would only have figured this out with the help of Makondo, but it turns out that with Honen, I will win this game if I draw any of A blank, D blank, T blank, and U blank out of the bag. Ian and I will tie if I draw I blank out of the bag. And I will lose, again assuming precise play by Ian, if I draw Z blank or R blank out of the bag. Of course, it goes without saying that if I don't draw the blank after Honen, I am sunk. So, what this means is my odds of winning after Honen are actually the same 1 in 9 as after Chi, because A blank, D blank, T blank, and U blank all happen with 1 in 36 probability. I get 1 in 36 because with nine unseen tiles and me drawing two of them, there are nine choose two, which is 36 different two tile combinations I could draw out of the bag. There is one blank and one of each of A, D, T, U, so that means the odds of me drawing one of these four combinations is simply one in 36 plus one in 36 plus one in 36 plus one in 36, which is four in 36 or one in nine. However, as I just said, I also tie if I draw I blank. And I blank happens two out of 36 because there are not one but two I's in the bag. So I win four and 36, I tie two and 36, and I lose the remainder of the time. With Chi, I effectively win four and 36 because one and nine equals four and 36, and I lose the entire remainder of the time. So by margin of two out of 36 tying, Honen is a better play. Now, like I said, I just told you that Honen wins with these particular draws and loses with these particular draws. It is highly, highly non-trivial to see why, and I don't know if any human player on the planet could figure all of this out precisely in a reasonable amount of time that you'd likely have at this stage of a complicated Scrabble game, as this one certainly was. I'm going to show you a couple of these endgames just to illustrate how crazy they are. Let's start with the two losses. What happens if I draw Z blank out of the bag after Honen? How does Ian win? Ian will have this rack A-D-I-I-R-T-U if I pull Z blank after Honen. And he's down 13 and he doesn't have a good rack. He doesn't have the Z so he's unable to score a ton of points and it does seem like it might be a little bit tricky for him to win. And it is indeed very tricky. He appears to have a single winning play in this position and it is the sick Dewey for six from the D in Oleander. The idea here, once you see that this is the winning play, is actually not that hard to see. Ian saves the word triad on his rack, which now plays in two spots, hooking Dewey to make do it, which he just set up, as well as hooking Stodge to make Stodged. As these two plays are pretty far apart physically on the board, I will be unable to stop Ian from playing one of them on his next turn. And after Dewey, I'm in a bit of a pickle, because now I have a Q and a Z, and despite having the blank, there's really no good way for me to get rid of both of them. In fact, it's impossible. So my best play here is just to play Chi for 33 in the top left corner of the board. After that, Ian goes out with Do It and Triad for 23. He's still down 17, but he gets 12 times 2, or 24 bonus points from catching me with an unplayed R, S, and Z. And that means he is going to win the game by 7, 434 to 427. So that is why, in my original position, if I play Honen, if I draw the blank, I will lose if the second tile I draw besides the blank is the Z. Now, I mentioned before that I also lose with a draw of blank R. I want to show you this endgame too. It's even crazier 
than the one where I draw Z blank. And it's something that I think very, very few, if any humans would find even given a large amount of time. It is absolutely mind blowing. Let me show you right now. If I play Honin and draw R blank, Ayn is gonna be sitting on A-D-I-I-T-U-Z. I'm gonna have Q-R-R-S blank, as you guys can see on the right, and there is one and only one winning play for Ayn in this position. It's an absolutely absurd play. There's no way I would find it, especially under time pressure. I think any top player would be hard pressed to find it at all, especially under time pressure. If you guys want a big challenge, then pause the video and see if you can figure out what is Ian's only winning play in this position. If you were able to figure it out, then major, major props. This is super impressive next level stuff. Ian's best play isn't scoring a lot with something like Ritz or Ads. It's playing Ad for 10 with Sag and DE. The idea here is setting up a massive play of Ads and Tiz, which would score a whopping 65 points on Ian's next turn if I don't block it. It's not too hard to see that I simply can't let Ian have that play. If I play Chi, on the top left, I will be able to go out after Tiz, but I'll let you guys check the math and show that Tiz scores so many points that I am still going to hold on and win. So I have to block it. The most logical way to do it, and as it turns out, my best way to do it is to play Rads for 11, holding QR blank, preparing to still play Chi in the top left corner on my next turn. And Ian's task is still far from easy. In this position, he still doesn't win by playing Ritz. As it turns out, this would actually tie, as I'll leave you guys to show. What Aya needs to do here is make a second consecutive setup. He now has to play Dewey for six, setting up Dewey and Tiz on his next turn. And now there's nothing I can do. The problem is I cannot block both Tiz and Ritz without keeping the cue on my rack. And if I do that, then Ian will go out with his ITZ elsewhere on this board, catch me with an unplayed Q, get 20 bonus points, and win the game easily. So there's nothing better for me to do than just drop the Q in the top left corner of the board, as we've been saying all along for 33 points. And I take a 41 point lead here, but the problem is Tiz is 41, and I still have the R on my rack, so Ian doesn't get anything for the blank since it's worth zero, but he gets two for my unplayed R, and he wins in nail-biting fashion, 440 to 438. There's one more endgame possibility I want to show you guys, namely what happens after Honin if I draw I blank. As I mentioned before, this will result with precise play from Ian in a tie game. Let's see how. In this position, Ian's first play is actually not all that shocking. It's Ritz for 39 from the RNO Leander. It's not so much this play though as what comes next that's absolutely mind-blowing. After Ritz, I'm going to be sitting on IQRS blank. My highest scoring play by far, and indeed my best play here, is to play Kitbags and Souk, scoring 45 points and going up 439 to 420. And this right here is where the stroke of genius is needed to ensure a tie for Ion. His most obvious play is to go out with Dura for 10. However, this, as I'll leave you guys to check the math, loses by 5. So Ion must not go out. Amazingly, I am unable to play out anywhere on this board with my remaining IR. So Ian can slow play here, and he must. His only tie is BA and AN for 12 next to the B in kit bags and the N in Oleander. The key idea here is that playing the I in that spot for me by an in would be my highest scoring play. So Ian stops me from doing that. Now my highest scoring play by far is Chi for 11. And I'm still up a lot. I'm up 18 points, and I've got an R on my rack, which will be playing in multiple places on the board. So now Ian needs to go out, and he needs to go out for 16 to tie, which is quite a bit. But he can. He can play Erd and Stodged, exactly 16, ending in a truly remarkable 450 to 450 tie. So if I were to go with Honin, these right here are the fiendishly difficult endgames that Ian would need to solve and play perfectly if he wanted to ensure a win should I draw R blank or Z blank or ensure a tie should I draw I blank. If you're Macondo, it's pretty easy. But 
and I say this with the utmost respect for Ayn as a player and a competitor, if you're a human, especially a human playing under time pressure and also the added stress of being in a finals of a North American championship, it is a lot easier said than done. So in reality, Honan will win a lot more than perfect play suggests, just because of the possibility of Ion misplaying some or all of these endgames if I were to draw the blank and one of my, in theory, losing tiles after Honan. So that is something to think about as well in determining which of these is my best play, again, given the circumstances at hand. Now, it turns out, though, after Chi, things are also a little bit murky, because, like I said before, this only wins against perfect play if I draw the blank. But as we'll see, depending on what Ion does, if he doesn't handle the next position precisely, then I may be able to steal a victory after Chi by drawing a tile other than a blank. So let's finally move on to this position and see what happened next. But the excitement is far from over, guys, so please stay tuned. As I said, I did not play my theoretically optimal Honin. I played Chi for 33. So now, as it turns out, Ayn was faced with this rack. He had A, D, I, I, U, Z blank. He's down 13 points. There is still one tile in the bag since I only played one tile on my previous turn. Ayn is looking at an unseen tile pool as you guys can see, of seven consonants and one vowel, A-H-N-N-R-R-S-T. Now, as I said before, she never wins if Ion has the blank, and there are indeed available plays here that would win for Ion with every possible tile draw. It's tricky, though, to figure that out. In the game, he played what looks like a very natural move. He played Atsuki for 35 points, burning his blank, but scoring well and pretty much guaranteeing that holding just an eye on his rack and drawing into this pool, he's going to be able to go out with his two tiles on his next turn, and as such, I'm only going to get one more play. The problem with this move is that it actually loses narrowly if Ion pulls one of the two R's out of the bag. So this play, while it does win otherwise, will lose two out of eight times. So it only wins six out of eight, which is pretty good, but it's definitely not eight out of eight. Let me show you why. If Ayan pulls an R, then I'm going to have this rack. My best play would be Tars and Azukis for 32 points. After this, I go up by 10 points, and I still have two ends on my rack. So all Ayan needs to do is go out for 6 points with IR, and he ties the game, go out for 7 or more, and he wins. But amazingly, he can't. IR is fairly inflexible as a two-tile combination. And his best outplay here is only worth 4 points. He's got a bunch of them, such as Rid to the D in Azukis. And this is going to lose by 2. I will win 426 to 424 in this line. It's worth mentioning that instead of Tars, I could have also just played Honin as we were looking at before. And I'll leave you guys to check. This would hold on and win by a single point as well. So, once again, Azuki, Ion's play in the actual game here is an inaccuracy, since it lets slip 2 out of 8 win percentage when Ion pulls an R out of the bag. So if not this, then what should he have done? There are several other places he could play Azuki as well. The highest scoring one actually scores considerably more than the 35 he got for this placement. It would be Azuki over here. It's pretty obvious that this is a very poor choice, because if I have the S, I'm going to hook it to make Azuki's on the double word score both ways, score a massive amount of points, and win. So that's out. Similarly, this placement is not a good idea, because if I have the S, I'm often going to have a play like Hast or Trash, scoring nearly 50 points, which will be enough to win the game. There's one other place Ion could play Atsuki, namely vertically next to the R in Oleander for 32. However, this has the same problem. If Ion draws the R, he is simply not going to be scoring enough points to go out after I hook Atsukis and play something like Charm, as I'll leave you guys to verify the math. So, what I needs to do here is extremely, extremely tricky. His best play is not Adzuki, but Azuki, sacrificing four points to leave off the D down the K column. And this indeed wins 100% of the time. It wins regardless of which tile Ion draws out of the bag. And the key idea here is that, yes, Ion sacrifices four points immediately by holding onto the D, but his outplays are going to score a lot more. Let me show you how this works. Let's say Ion draws the R, which was the troublesome tile from before. Now, 
he's threatening two pretty big outplays. He can play Rid and Stodged down at the J column. That D, so he to keep, so he can hook Stodged and play a three-letter word there. He can also squeeze Rid in on the 14 row, making Erd, Sig, and DE. And there's not really an effective way for me to block both of those. My best play turns out to just be Azuki's and Sharn for 30 points, which does put me up by 15. So Ayn's going to need 11 to tie to go out, given he'll be getting 4 from my unplayed MT. But as I said before, he can get it with this very sneaky fit of Rid between Pearly Use and Stodge. That'll tie the game. He's going to win by 4 when all is said and done, 428 to 424. Another reason that D is such a fantastic tile to keep in this position after Azuki is besides the Stodged hook, as we saw before, Ion can also put the D at the 2F square on the triple water score under the Ion Waiter. If he draws an N, he'll be threatening Din over there for 19 points, and if he draws a T, he'll be threatening Dit over there for 19 points. And it's extremely difficult for me to block that spot without undergoing a significant point sacrifice myself. So if Ion draws the N, the R, or the T, then he's going to win. It's not hard to figure out that if Ion draws the A, he's going to win because I'm going to have no vowels and can barely do anything. If he draws the H, he's going to win because I won't have anything other than one-point tiles. He's still going to be threatening several outplays, and he's also going to win. Once again, not too hard to see. I'll let you guys verify it. And lastly, if he draws the S, that's going to significantly hamper my scoring potential because I won't be able to hook stuff like Azuki's or Kitbags. And again, it's not hard to see. I'll let you guys verify that Ion would indeed win. So once again, Azuki for 28 down the K column, Ion's optimal play in this position. Ion's actual play, Add Zuki for 35 across the 12 row, loses 2 out of 8 if he draws an R. Now, when I played Chi, I had A-H-N-N-R-S on my rack. That means R-T were the two remaining tiles in the bag when I played Chi. So, as it turns out, there was a 50-50 shot that this could have cost I in the game. Because if I had drawn the T out of the bag, leaving the R in the bag for I in, as we saw before, I would have won by just one or two points after this play. If I drew the R out of the bag and left the T, then Ion is safe after this, as he'll be able to score a lot more with IT out of the bag. What happened? As many of you guys probably know, if you were watching the live broadcast, I drew the R, leaving Ion the T he needed in the bag. So I missed what turned out to be a coin flip to win the game, given Ion's error of playing Adzuki instead of Azuki. Now in this position, I'm completely lost as Ion has several reasonably high scoring outplays with IT. I make my best play here of Horas. Honin is equivalent. Both of them score 33 and get rid of the same points worth of tiles. And Ion went out with Zit from the Z and Adzuki for 14 points, winning by 9, 436 to 427. And here guys, once again, we see the difference because if Ion had drawn the R instead of that T, he wouldn't have been playing Zit for 14. He'd have been playing Rid for 4. 10 fewer points means Ayn wouldn't have been winning by 9. He would have been losing by 1. So that T draw, super key for Ayn there, given his play of Adzuki. He could have avoided that once again by playing Azuki down the K column, which would have won regardless of whether he pulled a T or an R or anything else. But like I said before, super, super hard to see that and think of all that, especially under time pressure and the added stress of an already super intense game one of this championship final. So overall, I would say this was a super, super well-played game by both of us. A couple of inaccuracies towards the end in the pre-end game. Uh, like I said, my play of Chi a couple turns ago, technically an inaccuracy as hard as that was to believe in the moment overplaying Honen. In reality... You could maybe make the argument that Chi has some merit because, as we saw, leaving one in the bag can induce some errors from Ion just due to the difficulty of predicting what he's going to draw and foreseeing all of the possible endgames. However, Honin could also induce a lot of errors because, like I said, when I draw the blank, even those endgames that are theoretically winning for Ion are devilishly complicated and it's super, super hard to solve under all of this pressure. So both of those plays, Chi and Honin, on my previous turn, do have some merit, I think, in terms of trying to induce a mistake. As it turns out, Chi did induce a slight mistake from Ion. However, Ion was able to escape and hold on to win this absolutely thrilling and remarkable Game 1, 436-427. I think my favorite position from this game 
was my Chi versus Honin turn a couple of moves ago. Like I've said multiple times, Honin is the theoretically optimal move, giving the best results against perfect play. However, both Honin and Chi have significant potential to induce errors against a fallible opponent just given the complexities of the resulting positions. As we saw in the game, Chi induced an error mostly because of the uncertainty and difficulty of predicting what Ayan was going to draw since there was still one in the bag. Honin, like we talked about before, could induce errors just because of how complicated so many of the endgames are when I have a blank as well as the Q on my rack. So I think it's really, really hard to say in practice which of these two plays is better because Honin is ever so slightly better against optimal play, but maybe Chi induces enough more mistakes by leaving one in the bag that it's actually better in practice against most humans. Really, really hard to say. In any case, part of what's amazing about Scrabble is that we can speculate endlessly on these kind of things without ever having a definitive answer. So I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on that position, and for that matter, on any of the positions throughout this game, because there were a lot of interesting turns. I know the bulk of this video was devoted to the last couple of plays just because they were the most mathematically concrete and intense, but there were still lots of other cool turns earlier in this game. So, what a way to start off this match. Definitely a tough loss for me. Great win for Ian, though. Super well played and back and forth game by both of us. And Ian now entered game two of this 2024 SPC Finals with a 1-0 lead. So, stay tuned tomorrow to find out what happened in game two. Really hope you guys enjoyed this video. Thanks so much for watching. Let me know what you think in the comment section and can't wait to show you guys game number two. Have a good one. Bye-bye.